Elijah was living in a land where everything had stopped growing. King Ahab had married the infamous Jezebel, daughter of the king of Sidon, who worshipped the god Baal. King Ahab abandoned the Israelite god Yahweh and served Baal instead. The prophet Elijah had informed Ahab that there would be no dew or rain except by his word. The Lord sent Elijah to a river valley across the Jordan called Cherith. There was water to drink, but nothing to eat. Ravens brought Elijah food in the morning and in the evening. I don't think the health ministry would have been impressed. Elijah seemed to survive the bird food. But as the drought continued, the river dried up and God sent Elijah right into enemy territory, into the country of Sidon, to a place called Zarephath. A widow was to look after him. Elijah's faith must have been tested to breaking point, never mind ravens bringing food. Now God was sending him into enemy territory and a widow would feed him. Didn't God know that widows were poor? Sure enough, when Elijah arrives, the widow's food supply was down to the bottom of the barrel. She's gathering sticks to make her last meal and then she would lie down to die. Elijah tells her to serve him first and then themselves afterwards. And the jar of meal and jug of oil would not become empty. Now it's the widow's turn to have her faith tested. In her poverty, she's asked to serve the stranger first. Can she trust his words? Perhaps she thought, what difference would one more meal make? The widow learned what Elijah already knew, that when God says he will do something, he will do it. It's a certainty. I have observed that myself. God said that Liz and I would have a son. We tried for seven years and then Peter arrived at the end of more than a year of amazing events that would be stretching the truth to call coincidences. As we followed God's leadings, his promise was fulfilled. As I said last week, it's not every day that God demonstrates his existence. Sometimes we fall so far behind Jesus that he has disappeared around a corner. When we look for him, we don't see anything. When we ask him what to do, we can hardly hear any answer. Elijah also discovered that after his confrontation with Ahab and the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel, Elijah was afraid. Hundreds of years later, the apostle Paul had also known the certainty of God in the face of death. Last week we read of the beatings, stoning, jail time and shipwrecks that Paul had endured. He tells the Philippians not to dwell on the hardships, but to remember the goodness of God and to give him the praise and worship that is his due. Remember what he tells us to do and keep on doing it until he tells you the next thing to be doing. That's how to survive times of famine as well as times of plenty. God gives us what we need. We read that Elijah was directed very specifically by God, first to the valley of Cherith and then to Zarephath in Sidon. If Elijah had decided to go somewhere else, he wouldn't have received the gifts that God had prepared for him. Some of the towns that Paul went to rejected his message of Jesus and the good news of God's love. They sent him packing with a beating or stoning. Paul kept on going. He didn't give up. Paul tried to visit several towns, but the Spirit of God seemed to tell him to keep moving. Eventually, Paul arrived at the port of Troas, and it was there that he had a dream of a man in Macedonian clothing, begging him to come and help him. 
That's how Paul came to Philippi the first time. You can read it in the book of Acts at chapter 16. They met a businesswoman woman at the place of prayer. She became a believer and gave them hospitality. But soon there was trouble in the marketplace and Paul was arrested and put in jail. And in the middle of the night, Paul and Silas were singing praise to God when an earthquake came along and set them free. Even the jailer became a believer. It was these people Paul was writing to when he told them to treasure up and tell each other the things that God had done for them and give God the praise and glory. That would be the secret that carried Paul through even these darkest of experiences. My sense for us today is that we need to spend more time remembering our own stories of what God has done for us in past times. But more than just remembering, we need to spend time sharing these stories with each other, however plain and mundane or outrageously strange they seem to us. God does strange things that are hard for us to believe. If it was easy, the church would be full. We had made a start with that in our God slots before lockdown started. But I would like to try and include this in our online worship too. It will take a bit of thought and preparation. God might even tell me what to do. In the meantime, start remembering your stories. Tell them to each other on the phone, in a video call, by an email, or even a letter if you still remember how to write and post a letter. Feel free to email or write them to me too. That's how we know these stories of Elijah and Paul. They remembered and told others who wrote them down. And here they are. Let's start collecting and sharing our own stories and experiences of God. He is the same God as he has always been. Loving, trustworthy, powerful, beyond our understanding. Let's praise and worship him. Amen.